Right. So last week here, we wrapped up um, chapter seven, um, kind of an interesting pause um, in our uh, progression through uh, Revelation here. Um, we're going to go ahead and review here in a quick second. Um, all right. The multitude in chapter seven are the result of a massive revolution in the Jewish faith. This is something that I tried to emphasize last week. It cannot be understated how, um, how important this is because no matter which denomination of Judaism you're talking about, um, none of them, by and large, accept Jesus as, as Christ, as the Savior. They've got, they've got their different reasons. Um, I've talked to, um, to different Jewish folks uh, uh, about their, their why, I guess, as to why they don't think Jesus was the Messiah that was foretold. Um, and you get different reasons depending on, I think, the tradition. Um, one that kind of keeps popping up, and I think it's, a, it's an issue of interpretation, is where Isaiah says that the government will rest on his shoulders. Um, they take that to be kind of reinforcement that while well, he was supposed to be a political savior as well as a spiritual one, that the, the physical government here on earth was supposed to rest on his shoulders, right? Um, but Jesus' words are pretty clear, right? He said, I'm, I didn't come to establish an earthly kingdom, an earthly empire. That's not what I came to do. I came to establish my kingdom. And, you know, had it been the one way, my followers would do this. But the, the thing is, is he, he clarifies that right there. He says, I'm not here to establish, I'm not here to become Emperor Jesus. I'm here to liberate people from their sin. And yes, I am establishing a kingdom, but it's not a kingdom of this world. So um, it's, a, it's a thing of speculation as to what exactly is going to take place. Um, but something or some things are going to happen um, that are going to spawn this 144,000. It could be the, uh, the tribulation that we've discussed so far that um, maybe the Jews come to see that... Um, all of this stuff is happening. Maybe Jesus really was the Messiah. So <laughs> maybe that kind of triggers the, uh, the ministry of the 144,000. Uh, but like I said, we're, we're kind of left to speculation there. But in, in either case, something big is going to revolutionize the Jewish um, viewpoint and, and interpretation of who Jesus was. All right. Um, there's my mouse. The song of the redeemed will resonate throughout heaven. This is a pretty interesting point. Um, following the ministry of the 144,000 and the redemption of the multitude, their praises resonate throughout heaven and seem to have a substantial impact on the governing body of heaven. So I think we need to take this as indication that these powerful figures in heaven, the elders, the, the, um, everybody seated around the throne, and the, the whole scene here, as majestic as that might be, that they end up kind of being impacted by the praises of the redeemed here. And we're going to talk a little bit more, more about that as we get into chapter 8 here. Um, there's a quote that I, re I, I read I really, really liked, so we're going to, um, we're going to cover that. Um, but since we'll rule and reign with Christ, it's worth remembering that we're going to carry with us, and already do now, a spiritual authority that is going to be unrivaled in heaven. Um, with the obvious exception, of course, being God. We are not over him, right? <laughs> but um, it, it's the fact that we are made in his image, a title that's not even given to the angels. As, as beautiful and as majestic and as powerful as I'm sure that they are, um, that's being made in his image is not something that is given to the angelic beings with them still being um, created beings, which is um, kind of a, a separate point here. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. All right, the last one here, we kind of closed out with this last week. He will wipe away every tear is an important phrase. Um, we see it both in chapter 7, and we see it uh, later on after the close of these things in chapter 21. It emphasizes two things. Number one, that God is with us through trial and pain. And two, he is close enough to be able to wipe away every tear. It's not just simply the fact that he's kind of standing at a distance and saying, 
cheer up. It's going to get better. You know what? I'm working all things out. He, the fact he's, he's intimately acquainted with us, so that way he's close enough to be able to wipe away our tears. I think it's, uh, um, it's not said just once. It's, it's said twice. Once in the middle of all these things going on, and then once later on when it's actually finished. So, interesting uh, um, phrase here. Let's get into chapter 8 here, and we'll read verses 1 through 5 to start. Um, do I have a volunteer to uh, get us going here? When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of the saints, went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. All right. Thank you, Dennis. Right off the bat, the first thing I want to do here, um, maybe you have run into this before or encountered this or not, um, but there is a scholarly debate about the placement of verse 2. Um, some scholars, that, that just in the reading of that, and you would actually have to go beyond verse 5 here, I'm, I'm trying not to rush too far ahead, um, but some have argued that verse 2 is actually out of place and is perhaps a copyist error on the part of the translators. Um, not that he said anything wrong or said anything different, but that it was just, um, their argument is just that maybe it got put up a little bit further than it should have been. Um, their argument is that it looks like the proper placement is found right before verse 7. Um, and if you, you know, want to go ahead and read down in there, you read verse 2 and you read that, you might see what they're talking about here. Um, and you're welcome to, 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 to read that, but as I've examined this claim, I really don't see there being as much alarm as what they make it out to be. It doesn't change the context. So, and that's one of the biggest things when, when studying is that you have to understand the various types of context going on, the language being used, uh, turns of phrase, um, the cultural setting, stuff like that. Um, if the meaning gets changed, maybe I can see what they're talking about. But there's no meaning change here, um, and, and there's there's no there's no real big issue. Um, so I don't think it's as much of an issue as some of them make it out to be. And now, granted, it's not a huge debate; it's just um, a, a relatively minor group, I guess I should say. Um, if you read it through with verse two being at where it's at, verses before seven, it doesn't change the broader context or intended meaning. And to my knowledge. The Greek manuscripts present verse 2 as being where it's at right now. So from the, the oldest manuscripts that we've got, um, they don't have it down towards verse 7. So there's not really going to be much of a difference here. Um, so it's, uh, it's not worth getting um, too worked up over, I guess I should say. Um, again, nothing changes meaning-wise, so. Anybody heard of that before, run into that? Heard of that from anyone? No? Okay. Good. Because <laughs> it's not a big deal. Um, I felt like it's noteworthy because um, analysis like that is important to me. And when I study, I want to make sure that I'm understanding um, any controversies surrounding what I'm studying. So, All right. Interesting little phrase here. There was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Chapter 8 begins with this dramatic pause right at the opening of the seventh seal. Recall that we took a break after the first six seals for chapter 7 to come around and allow for the ministry of the 144,000. Now, the seventh seal is opened up, those little wax um, signets here, and there's this ominous kind of a pause, it says. Um, if you were writing a horror movie based on Revelation, or kind of a scary flick or a play or something like that, um, this would be the time where everybody's kind of looking around at each other wondering what's going to happen next. Um, everything gets kind of quiet, right? But, but why? So, 
two big schools of thought here. Um, along that kind of a um, calm before the storm kind of a thinking is that this is like a breather or a quick intermission before what we see um, coming into the, the rest of the chapter here, right? Um, the pause is like a calm before the storm. It's the silence before this last seal gets unleashed on the earth. So the first school of thought there, um, if you wanted to put something down, just put that the first, uh, the first school is like a breather. It's just taking a quick breather before the, the kind of the grand finale of these seals. You know, we've, we've talked all this time about everything up until this point, and now having pauses, kind of like you're running a marathon and you, you stop to take a quick breather before you push through over the finish line. Um, that, that, that's, that's one. Um, the second school of thought, and if you wanted to go ahead, this, this is question one, if you, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, the first blank there is uh, breather, and the second one is actually praise. And I'll explain that here in a second. Give you a chance to, to write that down so I don't push too far ahead too fast. All right. The second approach here is one that I actually lean towards more myself. It's not that these two are necessarily contradictory with one another, these two approaches. Um, the second one, though, kind of makes a little bit more sense to me, and I'll explain why. Um, as the theologian R.H. Charles put it, the needs of the saints are more to God than all of the psalmody, or the songs, the praises, of heaven. The needs of the saints are more to God than all the psalmody of heaven. In other words, the prayers and praises of the saints mean much more to the heart of God than anything the angelic beings can offer up themselves. The idea here is that everything in heaven halts so that the prayers of the saints may be heard prior to the unleashing of this great and terrible seal, um, which brings forth the seven trumpets that we'll get into here. This is the interpret uh, interpretation I take personally because it fits well with Revelation's repeat theme of a combination between the, the need for justice, the righteousness of God, and then kind of it being a combination of the loving heart of, of, of God. Um, he's, he's pausing to kind of take in the, um, the prayers of the saints and telling heaven, you need to be quiet for a quick second. I'm listening to the cries of my people. I'm, I'm dwelling with them. I'm communing with them for a second. Um, so to me, um, and as we've kind of seen off and on, Revelation isn't, again, as we kind of mentioned last week, it's not all doom and gloom. There are tidbits in there where God's, um, his affection or his love, his kindness kind of shines through in the midst of all of this terrible stuff going on. All right. Um, so again, question one on your worksheet, um, the two schools of thought, uh, breather and praise, if you just wanted to kind of sum them up there. All right. Still in uh, verses three through five here. Um, the theologian Adam Clark tells us uh, something that I think helps clarify what's going on here in verses um, three through five, a pretty interesting passage here. He writes, it is not said that the angel presents these prayers. He presents the incense and the prayers ascend with it. The ascending of the incense shows that prayers, that the prayers and offering were accepted. Incense and prayer are frequently associated with one another throughout um, different times in scripture, and this is especially true um, in the old Jewish ceremonies and uh, in celebrations, um, most noteworthy with the first and second temples. I've touched on this before with the four horsemen and the whole, you know, do not touch the oil and the wine thing, how that's not about uh, a lack of luxury items. Um, it's actually kind of a, an allusion to a, a tradition that had turned into kind of a, um, a, a ministry point. Um, but it's not possible to read and understand Revelation without seeing and knowing the connections being made to the Old Testament and to Jewish sacrifices and practices. 
because rife throughout Revelation are, are things like this, examples where Jewish readers would say, oh, this is awfully similar to something that we, we do while in one of our ceremonies here. John knows what he's doing. Um, and this is question two on your worksheet. It is necessary to know Excuse me. It is necessary to know Jewish ceremony and traditions. Um, not everything, but it, you, get, you get a gist of it, and Revelation starts to make a whole lot more sense. <laughs> um, but it's necessary to know Jewish ceremony and tradition in order to truly understand and appreciate what Revelation is talking about. Um, some of the things that otherwise don't make sense all of a sudden start making a bit more sense because you see it in light of a sacrifice or a ceremony or practice that would take place. <clears throat> Excuse me. With this being said, in the temple, in the Jewish temple, incense was burned and offered before the first and after the last sacrifices of the day. It was as if the offerings of the people went up to God, wrapped in an envelope of perfumed incense. Here we have the idea that prayer is a sacrifice to God. The prayers of the saints are offered on the altar, and like all the other sacrifices, they are surrounded with this, this perfume, this incense, as they rise to God. Mankind may have no other sacrifice to offer God, but at all times, at all times, we can offer our prayers, and there are always angelic hands waiting to bring them to God. So it's, uh, you see that, you know, kind of going back into the old Jewish uh, ceremonies and, and uh, the temple rites, and then you see it again here in the end times. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty picture here for coming from the, the Jewish perspective. Like I said, John knows his crowd. He knows who he's talking to here. Um, and not just the Jews, of course. He's talking to all of us, but uh, he's using those um, foretelling or foreshadowing. Is, the, is the, the word. When you go back into the Old Testament and you read a lot of this um, ceremonial, you know, why are they doing all this weird stuff? And then you see it repeat later on in Revelation in kind of a different fashion. Um, it's pretty interesting to see. All right, the second point here, fire, praise, and judgment. Um, three through five are pretty, uh, pretty interesting verses, right? Uh, as beautiful as this whole picture is, right? You've got the, the, the incense and the prayers rising up to God. He's accepting all. There's this pause to be able to take everything in. It's a wonderful picture. And then it takes a pretty dramatic turn <laughs> after the incense and prayers are lifted up. Verse 5. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it to the earth. Whoa. Whoa. And then there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. So we go from this kind of a quiet, um, so, uh, not, not, not somber, that's not the word I'm looking for here. It's like this quiet, um, peaceful setting. And then he takes these, these hot coals and he flings them to the earth. And uh, you've got these um, the thunder, the, the lightning, the earthquake. Um, so what just happened, all right? What, what, what's going on here? That's a, kind of a drastic turn. Um, if you've ever had any question or any doubt in your, or anything like that in your mind about your prayers being heard on high, um, and that God would take them and use your prayers, um, he's using them right here. This is a picture and illustration of using them as kind of a catalyst for judgment and justice on earth. Um, this dramatic shift from the reception of praise and prayer to the outpouring of punishment on the earth is a powerful example of how God rallies with us to bring about judgment on the earth. Um, he hears us. It's, you know, earlier on in Revelation, we read about the saints and their cries going up. You know, God, when are you going to avenge our blood? Right? Remember that earlier? Um, when are you going to avenge our blood? And now you've got this angel heaping coals. You know, shortly after these praises coming up into earth, um, heaping coals down onto earth as part of judgment. Um, the picture that we're reading here comes from the vision of Ezekiel, in which the man in the linen cloth takes coals 
between the cherubim and scatters them over the city. We find that in Ezekiel chapter 10. Um, and it's very similar to what we see in Isaiah, where he takes the coal, take, uh, it takes the coal and touches his lips and says, now you're clean. Um, very similar to what we see there. Um, and this is question three on your worksheet too. So a, a lot of allusion again back to the Old Testament here. Um, we see similarities between which two Old Testament books in the early part of chapter eight. Those are Ezekiel and Isaiah. And I think part of the reason why God does this is it's not just simply that, you know what, all the stuff going on in the Old Testament was is just old-fashioned and done away with, and we don't need any of that now. Um, he operates kind of holistically, I guess is maybe the word I'm looking for, that you've got this, um, you know, he, he, he's taking imagery used back then to kind of reemphasize the point that was being made. So this picture then, comes and introduces something new. The coals, the insert, uh, I'm sorry, the coals that the censor introduces are um, bringing about some new woes. One way to put it is that the prayers of the saints are now returning to earth in the form of God's wrath. So while you and I can and do, excuse me, um, while you and I can and do, if, if you haven't yet, experience persecution, it'll happen as a believer, you're going to have it happen, it's, 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 a, it's a part of, um, of being a Christian, it comes in some point. Um, if it hasn't happened, the persecution that we experience is always temporary, but what we're getting into here following all of this is you've got temporary suffering, you've got judgment, and then you've got an eternity of restoration, right? So no amount of persecution, no amount of trial or pain that we experience on this earth um, can compare to the coming glory that's going to uh, be waiting for us, right? So um, let this kind of be a comforting reminder, I think, that God's word doesn't just promise that he'll pour out judgment on, on the unrighteous and on the, the, uh, um, those who have persecuted believers in the church, but that your prayers and your praises will be the fire that ends up accompanying, accompanying that, um, that judgment. So he's, uh, he, he, again, there's this that, that partnership that we see between us and God, that, that, uh, what Paul calls the koinonia, you know, that, uh, that he's working with us um, in, uh, in bringing judgment to the earth. So um, I believe that is going to be all that I've got here for now. Um, with that being said, as we um, start into chapter 8, any, um, any questions? I'm going to leave a, maybe a minute or two here for, uh, for that. Any questions on anything that we've covered so far? Not, to, not a bad idea to kind of periodically pause and uh, see if everything's sitting in. Okay, let me go ahead and say a uh, word of prayer here, and then we'll wrap up, all right? Lord, we, um, we love you this morning, God. We just thank you for, um, for what you are doing in our lives, God, and that you are um, active. You're, you're not just simply passive or, or responsive, Lord, but you are active and proactive in our lives, and that you are working all things out that we may be facing for your good and for your glory, and that no amount of, of trial, of, of, of pain, or anything like that, no amount of any of that can compare to the coming promises and the glory that you've got for us. I just thank you so much for that, God. Um, and I pray your blessings on us all as we um, move into service here. I pray that you be with us in, uh, in the worship and the message. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. <clears throat> I do I get going here. Where's Kathy, guys? Where's Kathy? She's at home.